Shar Margolis, Shar Communications Incorporated, and Shar Vision LLC do not endorse or offer for any purpose but entertainment the views of any guest or other expert on Shar Vision or UBN. I knew things before they happened from the time I was a child. At the age of eight, I saw a spirit at the foot of my bed and didn't know what it was. And in my 20s, I finally realized I had a special ability that could help others. I have learned that love never dies. There is a spirit world that can communicate with us, and we all have the gift of intuition. Join me, and together we will explore the possibilities of the unknown from beyond and more. This is Shar Vision. Hey everybody, it's Sunny and Shar, and today is January the uh, 8th, I think. Tony, is it the 8th? Yes, ma'am, it is. Yeah, it's, it's Friday, January 8th. And uh, Happy New Year. Happy New Year, everybody. It's a new year and a, hopefully a new beginning for us. And, you know, let's just be optimistic and positive about the transition in the White House. And let's just, let's just try to work together and everybody care about each other and find compassion and love to try to make this a better year. And also, I, I just am, you don't need a psychic to tell you that the next few months for the COVID-19 is going to be really contagious and dangerous. So I just want everybody to be extra careful the next few months. And um, I, my prayers go out to everybody who has suffered during this time. I, so many people have lost their homes. They're, they don't have food on the table. I mean, their, their, their loved ones have crossed over from COVID-19. And so one of the reasons I have um, my guest on tonight is because, you know, well, none of us are getting out of here alive. We're all going to cross over to the other side. And Netflix has done a special called... Um, I forgot the name of the special, Surviving Death, Surviving Death. And um, uh, one of the, the people that they've interviewed on it is, her name is Stephanie Arnold. And she wrote a book called 37 Seconds because for 37 seconds, she was proclaimed dead, literally. So Ste let's bring Stephanie in to talk about this because Stephanie, I'm, I'm really grateful that you're on tonight. And how are you, first of all? Thank you for having me, first of all. And, and I echo the entire sentiment that you were saying about COVID. It just seems like we're in just a, this bubble and having these moments where we're having these conversations of like light and dark. And um, so I appreciate you having me on. Um, I, I am... I am alive, so I am doing great. I, you know, I, I, I didn't come out of this without any scars or without any uh, post trauma because that I have. Right. Uh, but, but other than that, you know, I'm here to spend more time with my family, be with my children and my husband, and and see them every day. So. Well, it, you're a, you are a miracle. Thank you. And. I can tell that you feel like you have a purpose now. I do. And that's to help people take away their fear of death, I think. Am I right? It's part of it. Yes, absolutely. And, and, I, go ahead. And what else is your purpose? I think that under the circumstances that happened, because I had very detailed premonitions that it was going to happen for months before it happened, and you'll see it on the the first episode of, of Surviving Death, they talk about our NDA or my NDA. Um, I had very clear visions for months of how I was going to die giving birth. And no one took me seriously. And I had tests in the doctor's defense and all of the healthcare workers' defense. I had tests and those tests were negative. But ultimately, when everything came down to exactly the way I said it was going to happen and I flatlined and was put into a subsequent coma, um, it left the doctors and the clinicians looking at, how did you know? 
right? And, you know, the, the first part of our story was, I spoke up, I spoke up, I spoke up, I sensed it, I said it, I posted on Facebook, if anybody has my blood type, I'm going to need it. I wrote goodbye letters, I sent out goodbye letters. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you, uh, no, I, it was, it was so intense. I mean, people that are watching this that are on your Facebook or on mine were actual witnesses to some of these posts I posted back then. And so I feel that part of my purpose now, as I speak to the medical community, I speak it at hospitals and universities Mm -hmm. is about listening to not just your own intuition, but that of your patients. Mm -hmm. And at some point, um, the doctors have said to me, you know, I'm familiar with your case, but you can't expect me to flag everybody's file um, with a histrionic neurotic personality or whatever it is. And I said, I said, I, that's a fair point. I'm not asking you to do that, but just as much as this patient is telling you, they have a sense of foreboding they're just needing you to listen a little differently. And you yourself have your own intuition. And with that intuition, you can determine if this person is really a histrionic person. The one thing some of my doctors were missing was that I've had a baby before, I had a C-section before. This wasn't the fear of the unknown. This was something different. And I was used to high pressure. I was used to high stressful situations. So, they were missing that part of the equation of this is not normal behavior for Stephanie. Were you always intuitive? Like since you're a little girl? So yes. Um, yeah, I was going to say yes. I've <laughs> always been intuitive. I, you know, I always tell my, my students, you have to own your power. Yeah. So, so the first time it happened, I was 10 and my Cuban grandmother, um, what one would call is, more santera where where cuban jews they they uh you know she was very much into extrasensory perception and what have you as my father used to say all the time and um from 1500 miles away i felt a massive heart attack and i knew immediately it was her and um and it was it was this feeling that i couldn't shake and then the next time i felt something like that was with my uncle my mother's brother who you know, two days before we're, we're at high holidays and I hug him and I, I had this sadness that I was never going to see him again. And when you're a kid, mm-hmm. you think you're willing it to happen. Mm-hmm. And so I shut it down and it wasn't until my own foreboding that I was like, no, I, I have to speak up. I have to do something. Now I, now I look at it like I was on low voltage as a kid. I go asystolic, which means no electricity running through my body. And now I'm on high voltage. You know, you just brought up something really important that uh, other people had said to me that they were intuitive about something, knowing somebody was going to die or be sick, and they felt responsible because they knew it ahead of time. Psychologically, that's really a scary thing to go through. And, And when did you realize you had nothing to do with the death? You know, I, it wasn't that I, if I had intuitive feelings, I had feelings in, in high school that somebody was sexually abused, or I had some sort of feeling that somebody was being, like, there were just feeling, it would vibrate on my body wherever the pain was. Like, I knew when somebody had a migraine, I could, I would feel it in my body, it would resonate in my body. And I'm like, oh, okay, well, I'm going to stop perceiving all of this, and I'm just going to go play a video game. Like, I, I just... I needed right. it to stop. And so I, I, I shut it down to the point where I'm like, oh, no, no, I'm just not going to feel it. Don't want to. Don't, don't want to think that this person, you know, is not a good person. I don't want, no, no, I'm probably wrong. And just keep it moving and keep it moving right. and build callous over it. It, it um, seems to me like one of your gifts is being a medical intuitive. Yeah, I, and, I think that that's and, probably accurate. And, and, and they really brought it home to you in your own life. <laughs> it's not funny. It, d- <laughs> no, can, can you curse on your live? Cause I'm like, <laughs> it's, so, it's okay. It's so okay. I, I, I was fascinated to know that when you were legally dead, mm-hmm. I think I, I want you to take us through it, but you knew what was happening in other rooms. Mm-hmm. You knew who was pushing on your heart. You knew who was 
standing somewhere in the room, you knew what was going on. Can you tell us what, like, yeah. from the moment? And any, and and were you in pain the moment you died, or were you you were? Tell us, tell us. I'm so okay. Quiet. All right. So no, no, no. So um, I was I was acutely aware that the day I would give birth to my child was the day that I was going to die. So imagine I'm being wheeled into the operating room. I have I'm having a C-section. Mm -hmm. um, I the de the the visions were I was you know, going to bleed out. I was going to be cut from sternum to pelvis. The baby was going to be fine. And I would just, I would just be laying there in a pool of blood and, and die. And as I'm being wheeled in there, I was just aware that this was the last time I was going to see my daughter, Adina, my stepdaughter, Valentina. My husband was not there. This was pre COVID, but he was on a plane heading back from New York. And, um, my doctors were very compassionate to a point. They were like, you know, Stephanie, I know you're, you're scared because Jonathan's not here. I know you've had a lot of fears. Um, my anesthesiologist was like, you're, you know, you're okay. We're here, we're here, we're here. And at some point, you know, they told me from the time that they delivered Jacob to the time I flatlined was a period of about 10 minutes. I remember none of that. I feel like did you know when you you get scared out of your body, like you, you're scared to death? They yeah. told me they've spoken to me several times and I was catatonic. That was a, just not answering them whatsoever. Did you, um, did you know, yeah. did you get the blood type for yourself in case you needed a transfusion? Like in the back no, of what it, you have that peace of mind? So in, no, I didn't know that happened. So I'm O negative, which is a rare blood type. It's 7% wow. of the population. Um, your normal body has 20 units of blood. I was given 60 units of blood and blood products to save my life. And in a stereotypical C-section, they probably have um, six, maybe eight, eight units of blood ready. Um, and um, I had had lots of consultations. I even met with the head of gynecological oncology at Northwestern Memorial Hospital two months before my delivery and said, you're going to be giving me a hysterectomy. Uh -huh. And he's like, have you been on the internet? And I'm like, why, yes, I have, <laughs> but this is going to happen. Uh -huh. And then, um, and so MRI was negative. Everything was negative, but I had one consultation two weeks or three weeks before I delivered and that was with a fellow anesthesiologist by the name of Dr. Grace Lim. And she took the call and she said, she later she told me she had never had a patient speak so clearly about what was going to happen. Had had a baby before, had had a C-section before and had sought out specialists to save her life. And with that one phone call, she flagged my file and incorporated extra blood in a crash cart in my operating room. God bless 100, her. 100% would save my life. Okay, so. Yeah, I'm, I'm so yeah, sorry. So, Okay, so that, no, no, well, we're no ADHD and all over the place. I apologize. It's no problem. I I appreciate it. I will go. We'll go from childhood to preconception to wherever you want to go. All right. So, uh, so, so what happened? Okay, so um, I I ended up having an amniotic fluid embolism, and I flatline. I they resuscitate me. They put me in the surgical ICU and they put me in a medically induced coma. Right. So for six days, I am out on life support. When I come through, um, it was the, the day of my son's bris, the, the circumcision. And um, it blew my mind that I had delivered days before I had lost all that time. And so when I come out of this, the doctors and doing rounds, now you're in a teaching hospital, say, you know, how did you know? And I said, I don't know, I'm in a teaching hospital, you tell me. And um, and no one could tell me how. They said, you know, with a heart attack or an embolus, there's foreboding, but months before, no, I don't think so. So I ended up seeing a hypnotherapist and accessing a part of my brain that was shut down post-trauma about six months later. And I recorded those sessions. I videotaped them, if you could tell I'm a little type A. So um so in those sessions, I think I was just comfortable with her. She had, she was also a Cuban Jew. I heard her accent. It sounded very familiar, like my grandmother. And I'm like, you know what? I'm doing it over Skype. Let's just, I'll relax. Mm -hmm. And in those moments, I was able, she describes it as you're going in as an observer. This already happened to a piece of you. Mm -hmm. And we're going to ask access 
film strips in the brain to see if you can find out the answers of what happened and where you were. Because I could remember nothing when I came out of it. Um, in one of those sessions, after 30 hours of the sessions, you see my body seize and convulse and then talk about who hit the button for the code. Now remember, I had a curtain in front of my face having a C-section, so I couldn't see below my neck. Um, I saw my anesthesiologist was by my feet. I saw which nurse jumped on my chest to give me CPR. Um, I saw that um, that my doctor didn't deliver the baby, that my doctor kept saying, this can't be happening, this can't be happening. And, and then I saw what my daughter was doing down the hall in the labor and delivery room. I saw what my husband was wearing getting off the plane. And, um, and then I saw spirits. I saw hundreds and hundreds of spirits. I saw that, you know, people talk about the lights and- Did you, okay, I, okay, I'm a little confused. Are you talking about when you went to the hypnos hypnotherapy yeah. to do this? Yeah. Or, or when, yeah. It, when it really happened, when it, okay. No, when I, okay, okay. So, so I'm gonna tell you the, this okay. crazy story and I'm gonna come right back to it. So, so then I saw hundreds of spirits okay. and, and I saw my grandmother um, right next to me just before I flatlined. I saw my spirit perpendicular to my body. So I'm the observer, there's Stephanie the observer, then there's Stephanie the spirit and there's Stephanie the body. Okay. And I'm watching this like a 3D movie. And then all of a sudden the roof lifts off of the hospital floor, the walls you know, start to disintegrate. I start seeing hundreds and hundreds of, I don't see any buildings. I don't see, uh, I just see people and I see I'm um, two steps below where they are. Um, it's warm, inviting, no problem. I see my uncle who, um, who tells me you're a fighter. You've always been a fighter. You fight this. My grandmother, my, um, my grandma, like my, um, my grandmother from my mother's side. And then I see people I don't know. I see, um, a little boy who looks like my best friend who died when he was seven years old, who I never knew. And then I saw my husband's father. Now his father died in 1998 and this happened in 2013. So they had messages to give me to the people that I knew. So then I come out of my hypnotherapy. So I'm taking you back to reality for a minute mm -hmm. and I am crying, I'm a basket case. And all of a sudden I feel better. And my husband, just to give you perspective, former Air Force pilot, PhD, University of Chicago, economist. Do I need to say anything else? There's, there's no spirit in him right now. There's like agnostic right. and inquisitive, right? So I come out of this and he's like, are you okay? And I show him a little clip of the video and I, and he can't handle it. It's, it's way too painful. I, if anybody wants to see it, it's on, it's on my website. I'll give you whatever it is for access afterwards. So He's like, okay, well, how do you know this isn't a recalled episode of Grey's Anatomy in your head? <laughs> so I said, after I was done calling him a lot of names, I said, it's fair point, very fair point. So I called the therapist and I said, how do you know what I'm telling you is true? Mm -hmm. And she said, well, uh, the first thing is, is that may, we don't get validation that is true, but um, sometimes patients just feel better and you feel better. And that's the only validation we need. And I said, that's not good enough for me. I have witnesses. Mm -hmm. So lucky for me that I had this on tape. Um, so I took the tapes back to the doctors who were present at the hospital. And I said, um, I said, I don't know if any of this is true. I said, but there were two crash carts. The first crash cart didn't work, but the second crash cart did. Um, that mean? My anesthesia. So they, they fired up the first crash cart. It What's did not cart? light up. Um, what they do, the defibrillator to, okay, to okay, jolt okay. Um, your heart back. And, and so they had to bring in a second crash cart. So my anesthesiologist is quoted as saying, well, I don't, I don't remember that. And you'd think I would remember that, but everything else is pretty accurate. And then she found out later that there was a second crash cart brought in. Oh. And then my, my OB said, I said, did you say this can't be happening? This can't be happening. She said, I did, but in my head. And then I said, 
um, this nurse came by while I was at the hospital thanking everybody for saving my life. And the nurse who was in management comes over and she's like, Mrs. Arnold, you don't know who I am. I said, you broke my ribs. <gasps> and she said, I would do it again to save your life. Aww. And she turned around and my, the, the CNO of the hospital said, she went back to her office and she cried because Aww. you should not know that. Oh um, my goodness. And then there were little things. So Jonathan, of course, is listening to all this. And, and he's like, Julie, my OB, Julie, you know, you deliver the baby, you deliver the baby. And she's like, no, I didn't. And, and then he says, Stephanie thinks that the guy not that we visited, the resident that was in the consultation there that day that we went in two months ago delivered the baby. But, but you know, she was on guy not rotation. So this wouldn't be, that, that shouldn't be right, right? Mm -hmm. And she looks at him and she looks at me and she says, well, actually, because we're in a teaching hospital, if there are residents in the hallways and the operating areas and everything, we offer them to participate in the surgery. So, mm -hmm. yes, she was the one that delivered Jacob. Wow. Yeah. So, and then, and then, okay. So then I have all these messages, right? Then I have these spirits. So I, I don't know what to do with it. So I call my best friend and I said, Ro, um, I, I think I saw your brother, but but I could be wrong and, you know, it might have been a dream. And she's like, what are you talking about? I said, I said, he kept saying he misses the way you twirled his hair. And she dropped the phone and she started crying. And she said, Stephanie, how do you know this? And I said, what did I say? And she said, I used to twirl his hair every night in order to put him to bed. That gives me goosebumps. And then I said to Jonathan, I said, I saw your father. And he says, tell him I said, hi. Right. Then he walks out. So I said, listen, he had a tweed jacket. It was like beige and had things on his elbows and, and it had patches on it. And he had his ass up, but he had like green stripes in it. And he was holding a coin and it was a foreign coin. And I was going into all these descriptions of the poem. What does he need me to say? And I find that I had to sleuth it. And so he's like, hi, I am. My father never owned a tweed jacket, and I don't know what the heck you're talking about, but the next time you see him, tell him I said hi. So then I go to everybody in the family, and the family member's like, what is Jonathan talking about? Did it have green stripes in the lapel and everything? And I said, yes. And so she said, that was his favorite jacket. So I go back and, Jonathan, what are you talking about? His favorite jacket? He's like, well, if you would have said herringbone. And I said, oh, herringbone. And I'm like typing up herringbone. I'm like, that's the name of a stitch and tweed jacket. I'm like, are you kidding me? And then, I was sitting with, um, and I write about this in the book, I was sitting with one of his brothers and I, I was talking about the coin and, and he says, you know, it's interesting you say that. I was going through one of dad's old suitcases one time and in, behind the zipper in the crevice of the suitcase, there was a coin. And I said, can you describe it to me, please? And it was almost verbatim. I look at my husband, I said, F you. And now I know the message. So, <laughs> so, so that was, that was the journey into uh -huh. there is life after death. It's not, you know, we, we just go from a solid to a gas. It's just been, it's just been overwhelming to just kind of be plugged back in and then just say, okay, now I'm, I have to breathe into this and just accept it. We're, we're, when a hard journey. Were there spirits that you saw that were familiar, but you didn't really know who they were? No. Just you knew there were. The, I knew my grandmother. I knew my aunt. I little, knew my uncle. And the little boy. the little boy. Well, the little boy I never met, so I didn't know he looked familiar. Jonathan's father I had seen in pictures, um, and there were other there were other people, but it was almost like a wash of people. I, it was a congregation kind of looking and curious as to who this person is, mm -hmm. um, and I felt a constant tethering to my stomach. So every time I would turn around, I would get a glimpse of what was happening in the OR. Mm -hmm. And my uncle would tell me, just don't look at that. Just look at me. Just let's, let's talk. Let's catch up kind of thing. And, um, and then by the time I went back in, it was in the regression therapy, in the hypnotherapy, it hurt to reenter. It was, it was the way that I describe it is it's, it's like an umbilical cord. Mm -hmm. And as the soul flies, when it's, when you flatline, it's severed. When you go back in and you're attached, it's a, it's a hard pull back in. And it was 
you can see it on the video of me like like just jolting back into place like as it as it comes back in so she told me it wasn't going to hurt the way that um that it did the first time around and she didn't tell me the truth so so yeah it's um it was definitely a about the a journey to say the least next the spirit body the ethereal body to the physical body the the silver yeah. thread so when what's interesting is that you know when people talk the what? What does it look like? The the. So it's, I I look at if you it, as the observer, I looked at it as a movie that was a sort of um, had a tint to it, like I was outside of it looking at a movie. The spirit was bright and glowy. It was still my physical form, but right. it almost looked like my whole body had a facial, like I was just. I was just, I was just going, it was whiter, it was softer, it was, and it stood out, comparatively speaking, to the muted color of the room, if that makes sense. Uh -huh. And when people talk about seeing the light, I did not have that experience, but maybe if I was the eyes of the spirit, as opposed to the eyes of the observer, because when that flat line hit, because the spirit was perpendicular to the body, so as you're... I'm watching the countdown of the EKG unit beep, beep until flatline. Mm -hmm. When flatline hit, I saw it as a shooting star. Mm -hmm. So that might describe the white light that people see if you're in the eyes of spirit as opposed to. You have a choice yeah. to, to, to go to the spirit world or stay here with your family. I don't really know how to answer that because I fought so hard to be here. Um, I found the love of my life and, and I was just like, this is not going to happen. This is not, I am not going to let this happen. And the producer mind in my head was like, oh, no, 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 no. I'm going to produce these life-saving measures and I'm going to make sure this happens and control whatever you want to call it. I was like, once I was there, yeah, it was nice to see my relatives. It was it was warm. It was like a warm beach, but there was no way that I wanted to stay there. It wasn't. It. I don't know whether one has the choice. And I I've talked to the rabbis before about like predetermination and free will. And I was just having this conversation today. I believe that when your expiration date is your expiration date, mm -hmm. that's your expiration date. Right. And maybe it was always in my cards that I was going to survive a catastrophic amniotic fluid embolism. However, how well I survived was completely determined of my voice and speaking up through my free will. I sensed something, I said it. I had the choice to not say something, right? Exactly. If I did not say something, maybe I would be in a permanent vegetative state like a, a huge percentage of these women are. It's, it's a it's a one in 40,000 risk where basically amniotic cells get into the mother's bloodstream. And in 50% of the cases, I mean, actually the numbers are astoundingly high. Um, you won't make it through the first phase. And the second phase, if you're in a hospital or at home where they don't have access to a lot of blood, you're not going to make it. And it, it happens in seconds. It is, it is one of anesthesiologists worst nightmare. OBs don't even talk about it because it's such a rare occurrence. And at the time that I had mine, Northwestern delivered 12,000 babies. They told me that they had 10 in their history. Six women did not make it and the other three were in permanent vegetative states. So to have the, the survival that I've had and to be able to give back and talk and, and, and be the advocate I am is a direct result of my voice and good medicine and, and them listening. Everybody's intuition, like you talk about. Well, it's, well, thank God you listened to your intuition. Thank God you were adamant about it. And you had, you had, you did not have any um, education in, in uh, medicine at all, right? Your, what's your your what's your education in producing? No, my 
Yeah, my background is television. I used to produce reality shows. I ran a division of Endemol and and worked and did shows in Spanish language for Telemundo and um, like Deal or No Deal and um, developed. I worked in New York and worked on the New York Magazine Awards show and the Tree Lighting Rock Center and what have you. And um, and so for me, I'm very research oriented and I'm a producer. So when I started having these visions, I was diagnosed with a placenta previum, which is a one in 200 risk where the placenta is growing on top of the cervix. Mm -hmm. In most cases, it'll move out of the way, but if it doesn't, they talk about the worst case scenarios, you have a, a C-section and that wasn't the problem. The problem was as soon as he, the doctor said that, and I was in New York at the time, I was splitting my time at NYU, Langone Hospital and also Chicago, you know, um, I had a sinking feeling that my placenta previa was going to turn into a placenta accreta, which is what Kim Kardashian had, which is the merger between the placenta and the uterus. Mm -hmm. Then I read that that will turn into, you could have a hysterectomy and from that you could bleed and you could hemorrhage. And if that happens, then you and the baby could lose your life. And what? it, oh, yeah. sorry. No, no, I, I, it felt so strong. And this is what I talk about to people about the difference between a premonition and a casual thought. I'm not a neurotic histrionic person. I, I work well under pressure, but it was a knowing. It was a hundred percent a knowing in the pit of my stomach and the hair on the back of my neck and everything. To, and I looked at my husband and I said, this is going to happen to us. The only difference is the baby's going to survive. It saved your life because you were so intuitive about this. Now, what do the doctors think about this now? What are they skeptical? Are they believers? Did you scare them? What happened? All of the above. Um, I, so they've been very gracious. They've been on every talk show with me. They've, um, they're on my one OB is on the Netflix series and you, you can hear her talk and how much it's changed her and how it's changed her life. My anesthesiologist who like to use, like to joke before was like, you know, I put people to sleep. I don't have to talk to them. Now she's more concerned about how people are feeling. Um, the other anesthesiologist who is now head over at UPMC over um, having her as head of OB um, anesthesia there, she's like, it has a hundred percent changed the way they practice medicine. So and done an amazing yeah. job helping people help others. Mm, thank you. Cause you're telling them to listen to their patients and listen to their own intuition. The thing is, is that everybody, you know, thinks that they're compassionate and they're caring and, and they are. And especially in time of COVID and everybody is overwhelmed. It is, it is so unbelievably painful what's going on every day, but their own intuition can tell them, um, maybe you need to spend a little bit more time with your family because I feel that this is, the end is near, even when people don't want to believe it or when patients are in a precarious situation where they either want to duck from a diagnosis or they feel something, but they're afraid to speak up because the doctors know better. Mm -hmm. It is not worth staying quiet if it's going to save your life. The right. worst thing that can happen is they're judging you. You're crazy. You're hormonal. Okay. All of those things. I'll right. send flowers, chocolates, and I will never have another baby ever again. <laughs> but you will never regret speaking up and being wrong. You will if you're right and you're dead right. Oh, wow. That's profound. I, I want to tell you when, okay, I want to explain to the audience that when I, I did a show a few weeks ago and, it and I wanted to know about people's near-death experiences and Tony took a call and the call was dropped and the call was you, right? What, it, it was. But what you don't know, Stephanie, is my sister is a doctor of psychology and does past life regressions. She's, she's a hypnotherapist. She's, I, I better not say how old, she's 13 years older than I am. So, and I'm not, yeah, yeah. Whatever. I mean, she's like wisdom. She's all about yeah. wisdom. Yeah. Amazing. And I'm writing a book now. And she said, I, you should ask people again about past uh, about their near-death experiences because I already did one show on it she said you should do it again because I feel like we're missing something 
I feel like you're missing something. I said, yeah, you know, I kind of have that feeling too. I'm missing something. And the, what I was missing was you. And you, and that, and then, and then what people don't know is that Stephanie went out of her way to Facebook me and say, I was the call that was dropped. I had a near death experience. I want to share it with you. So I almost, I really believe it's divine intervention. And I'm so grateful to you for coming on and talking about this. Can I talk about it in my book? <laughs> Of course, of course. No, my friend Isabel Rivera, who used to work for um, Kelly and, or Regis and Kathy, uh -huh. was the one who told me about it. She's like, Char is live on Facebook. You, uh, they're talking about NDs. You need to call in. And I was like, okay. Oh, well, please thank her. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm so grateful. Now, I want people to read your book. So mm -hmm. how do people get to, to see your book? It's 37 seconds, right? It is, this is, um, this is what the old book, the audio book just came out today with the oh, Netflix of, so thank you. So we, um, so I, on my website, if you go to stephaniearnold.net slash audiobook, if you opt in, you can get a free prologue download. So you can actually hear me narrate. That was the hardest part of the whole thing, deciding to narrate this book. Oh, wow. Um, I don't know how you did that. Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was not comfortable. I think I took for granted that, you know, I've spoken about the story that, okay, TV is fine. But when you read the words and you go through the descriptions again, I mean, watching the Netflix stuff is only like 13 minutes. But I mean, my doctors were taken right back to the OR because Ricky Stern had done an unbelievable job with like all of the cutaways and I got nauseous and sick. Well, the same thing happened when I was reading it. You can hear it. So the audio book is now available on Audible, Apple. It's it's wherever wherever books are sold. Seven and, seconds. Yeah. Mm -hmm. By Stephanie Arnold. Stephanie, thank you so much for joining me today and and teaching all of us about your experience. And I respect you so much for having the chutzpah to. <laughs> Not only warn your doctors about it, listening to your intuition, knowing it was an all-knowing feeling, and that's what our intuition is, and sharing it with us, because it can mean a matter of life and death, and you're a perfect living example of it. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you so much. I hope we can stay in touch, and I hope you'll come back again. I would love it. And yes, I'd be honored to be part of your book and your story and, and talk to you and your sister about it. It was pretty profound. Yeah, you would, you would love my sister. And please thank Isabel for me. Isabella? I will. Whoever was Isabel it? Isabel Rivera. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, Kelly and Ryan, I appreciate it. Okay, take good care. A happy, healthy new year. Thank you. Thank you, you too. Okay, take care. Pleasure. Okay, wow. That was really incredible tony wasn't it i loved it that was awesome yeah wasn't it like just amazing so i i know i said i would take some phone calls uh do we have anybody calling in oh for sure <laughs> we have so, uh, so yeah we have several people that want to in fact a few that have near-death experience so if you want to okay take let's hear let's okay. hear the near-death experience so we have That'd a be... 248 Oh, there you go. That's Michigan. Michigan, you're on the air with Char. Hello. Hey, Char. It's Helene. How are you? Oh, Helene. Good. How are you? <laughs> I'm okay, Char. How are you doing? I'm, 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 thank God, touch wood. I'm doing great. Are you in Florida? Yeah. How are you? Yeah, we're down in Florida. How's Mike doing? Okay. Good. That's okay, but I'm okay. Well, we're going to send positive energy your way. Thank you. He needs it. Thank you. Thank you. Send to Michael. But and what an interesting story that Stephanie had. Wasn't that amazing? So it's Unbelievable. Um, unbelievable. Feeling an R initial around you. Um, is, R, yeah. is that you? Is that your mom or your... My, or or, it's my mom, my mom, my mom. I feel like your mom's watching over Michael. Oh. And I feel like she's probably. Saying, 
Yeah, and I feel like in, in Michael's attitude is positive, right? Always. Yeah, he's such a sweet man. Um, I know. I feel like, um, God, you know what's interesting? I want to make sure he's not dehydrated. Was there an issue about dehydration around him? Um, fluid. It, there's a, there's an issue with fluids and, and, you know, the kidneys and fluid in the lungs. and. Oh, wow. Okay. He's sick, Char. Oh, I'm so sorry. Is he in hospital now? Yeah. Okay. Well, we're going to send him all kinds of good... And who else is the other R? Is that his mother? Um, his mother has an R in her name. No, but your mom's the R. Yeah, I think because you're calling My him. mom's the R. Yeah. No, it's my mother, basically, that he was had the attachment to. Yeah. Yeah, it's your mother that I'm getting. Yeah. Yeah, it would be. It would be her. Did your mom but, um, I, Does your mom end in an A? I'm sorry? Your mom end in an A, her name? His mother ends in, his mother ends in an A, R-A. R-A, like Sarah or? Yeah. Sarah's there too with him. Well, that, that's really, that would be our family. That would be, Sarah would be um, my great grandmother, but I don't think he knew her. Okay, well, I, there's a Sarah there. But that's on. Um, I don't know all the, I okay, don't. Okay, that, so that's. But I know the lady with the R is there, and then there's somebody that ends in R A besides Nora. His mother's Nora. Nora. Then that that's who's with him. Okay, and then my mom too, probably. Yeah. Yeah. I hope so. Yeah. Okay. I, I but did did you have a near death? Yeah. Well. I, I actually did, but I was actually calling because my mother did. She, um, well, first, really quickly with my father with the intuition that something was going to happen the night before he died, I, but there was nothing we could do where we were all together and he was kept saying, you know, to my mom, Roz, where exactly, what row is your father buried in at Hebrew Memorial? What row, what aisle? Um, and then he said to Mike, what row, what aisle is your father buried? And he wanted to know where everybody was buried the night before he died. And he wasn't sick. Oh, wow. He wanted to know everything. And then the next night he died actually of an asthma attack very suddenly in the waiting room at Providence Hospital. And with my mom, actually, she she um, had said that she never, you know, she would she rescued Shih Tzu's she took dogs you know mm -hmm. and she never wanted her dog to have his teeth clean and um she my mother was very sick in the hospital she actually had crossed over said that um uh so the day that she got really sick it took a turn for the worst i went and had her d dog's teeth cleaned uh -huh. and she didn't want it she, she was very fearful for her for him to his, his name was Mazo. They have his teeth clean. She's no, no, no. I'm afraid for him to have his teeth clean. But he needed to have his teeth clean. So I took him, and he he had an allergic reaction to the anesthesia, and actually flatlined on the table. No. And it was the same time that she did. Okay. Oh. And so what happened was they worked like for four hours. They brought they got him back. Oh. She goes ahead and they brought my mom back and she opens her eyes and she said, oh, you know, I saw my sweetie, but he sent me back and said it wasn't time for me to go. So, oh. you know, Eric, my son, Eric said, well, maybe it's because you didn't look the same as you did when he left 30 years ago. Oh. <laughs> and she said, no, probably it's because I didn't have my hair done. But then the <laughs> next thing she said, what about mom's <laughs> And she said, the, the lesson learned here is next time I go, I'm going to make sure I have my hair done. And <laughs> so she made arrangements for somebody to come in to make it before, before she died, she was, went to hospice and she wanted to make sure somebody had came in to sign to do her hair. So she looked very nice. But, um, but the thing of it is, is that when she opened her eyes, she said, is Mazo okay? Because when she crossed over, she actually saw Mazo. That's amazing. And 
Isn't that? And I said, Mom, no, he's fine. He's fine. Everything's fine. She said, are you sure? And Mazel would, every night before she would go to sleep, you know, when she was in the hospital, she would call, Mazel would sing for her. And she says, I want to hear him sing. So I had to go home to make him sing for her. But she actually said, she knew, she said, something's wrong with Mazel, something was wrong, because she couldn't figure out why she saw him on the other side. Wow. That's interesting special <laughs> oh, that's so i yeah so, but so you, helene i i got it i've got to move on because we got to take one more yes call. go but i'm sending all right send well. my love to mike send my love please please anything all kinds of i will i will thank way. you sir okay god bless you bye-bye all right thank you pleasure bye-bye Okay, Tony, do we have time for one more? We have Did time. We have about four minutes. So let's get, uh, I believe, Tiffany, I think. So 818. Okay. Come on. Hi, hello, hello. Hi, Tiffany. Hello. How are Hi. you doing? Hi. Good. Oh, my God. Hi, Char. Hi. My daughter just woke me up and said, stop on, call her right now. Iman. Oh, how great. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, I can, good. I can hear you. Did you have a near-death experience? Yes. Yes. Tell us. Turn that down, Iman, because I can hear her feedback. Okay, do you want me to tell you about it? Yeah, tell us about your near-death experience. We only have a couple minutes. So, okay. I was working in the Department of Justice. I was the director of... Uh, white collar crime. I was assigned to a case involving Epstein. I was trying to work it up. They were telling me there were no police. I called in the feds. They sent me people to work with me for free. I went to work one morning. Everyone was gone because the new attorney general was being sworn in. Someone came into my office, knocked me out. They told me, I remember being startled. They told me, but I don't remember. I was unconscious for 30 minutes. I ended up having a moderate brain injury, post-concussion oh. syndrome, and had to move abruptly off my island with the help of the FBI. Oh but goodness. what I can tell you is that I know I died. The pictures are horrible. I mean, you remember what I looked like. It was unrecognizable. But I saw my mother's partner in life, her boyfriend, lean, he was white. He was leaning against the wall with, uh, on his knee, like leaning back and shaking his head. No, he was very upset. I was very aware of him being there. Mm -hmm. I was very aware of another friend of mine being there. Um, and they were, these were men who were like, like guardians to me. Um, Did your long story short, the U.S. Attorney, yes, your spirit both your of them. Body your spirit left your body. Yes, I know that I know that I was gone. Wow. Wow. And. The U.S. attorney called me and she said, Tiffany, you better cross your T's, dot your I's, watch your back. I said, no, I'm going. She said, that's the best thing. She goes, and for your boss, which I didn't know to say, they're not going to investigate what happened to you when an assistant attorney general like you leaves looking like that is wow. horrible. Wow. Yeah. That's yeah. Amazing. That's yeah. Incredible. Wow. Well, Tiffany, it's so great that you got through. It's so great to to talk to you. I wish we had more time, but we've yeah. got to go because uh, okay, I only have so many minutes on air. So that's it. So I wish you a happy, healthy New Year. It's so good to talk to you. You too, Shar. Should I go to the Virgin Islands again? I I would I would be very careful the next three months. I, I, okay. I, I, I'm just telling everybody the next three months are going to be deadly with the coronavirus and to be extra, okay. extra careful, just be extra, extra careful, okay. you know, to okay. be quarantined is probably okay. the smartest thing anybody can do. Thank you so much for calling, sweetie. Thank you, Char. Miss you. Okay. I miss you too. Thank you. God bless oh. you. <clears throat> be well. Okay, everybody. Wow, what a night. It went so fast. Well, it's it's always so great to have people like Stephanie Arnold on to help us understand that there's there's 
life beyond this one. And that's why I always tell people it's so important to live with a clear conscience, to live with kindness, goodness, and love, because when you get to the other side, you want to be in a good neighborhood. You want to be in a good place. And if, if, you're, if you don't live with a clear conscience and goodness and love and kindness, watch out. <laughs> I'm writing about it right now in my new book. I'm excited for you guys to read my book when it's, you're going you're gonna to be sick of me talking about this book. <laughs> Anyway, um, Tony, thank you so much for everything. Stephanie, thank you for being on the show. Um, Helene and Tiffany, thank you for calling in. And uh, I wish everybody a happy, healthy new year, but we're going to see you next Friday night. So be well, take care, and remember, intuition will take you places logic never could. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.